Valve? Yeah, remember them? They used to make something called video games. After the unfathomable success that was Half-Life, Half-Life 2, TF2, basically all the games Valve has ever made, it was thought that would be really hard for them to make another godly game. How do you make a game as revolutionary as Half-Life 1, with the story and world building of Half-Life 2, and the humor of Team Fortress 2, without rehashing any of their previous games? Oh, well, I know. You hire a ton of college students straight out of college who made a very simple game game about portals in a couple weeks and give them the tools and resources to port it over to your game engine. But how do you make one of the best games ever with arguably repetitive gameplay, linear maps, and boring world design? Well, they did it alright, and they also made a second one. Portal, well, it didn't just randomly fall out of the sky upon us randomly. Before Portal became Portal, it started off as a small student project in the early 2000s called Narbacular Drop. Before you say, why are you talking about this game nobody has ever heard of? I clicked on the video about Portal, not about this. Well, firstly, I think it's important to know what Narbacular Drop was and how important it is to what Portal 1 and Portal 2 became. Narbacular Drop is a very short game, managing to be even shorter than the original portal at around like nine minutes but oh my god it's a miserable nine minutes you can tell that this was a student project because it sucks the game starts off by telling you the story behind whatever is happening but good luck reading it because it goes by so quickly i had to pause and rewind the footage to read what it says once upon a time they lived a beautiful princess that was admired by her whole kingdom i don't feel like reading all this but it explains the story behind how this princess got kidnapped and imprisoned by a demon in a cage and how the spirit of the mountain wants to help her escape by opening portals to help her get around. You start off the game in this cage and right away, you can tell how ugly this game is. It looks like one of the older Doom games. I'm surprised there aren't demons I'm supposed to be fighting here. Getting out of the cage is pretty simple because all you gotta do is open a portal on your wall then another one anywhere outside of the cage. You're then greeted by your first puzzle with a big box and two buttons on the floor. I want you to keep this puzzle in mind, especially for later by the way. How you solve this one is by placing a portal underneath the box and another one above the button and have the box fall onto the button so it weighs it down then go stand on the other button and wait for the door to open then place a portal behind that door and then you go over there the rest of the game is full of puzzles up until the end where there really isn't an ending but it just says thank you for playing but how did this game become portal during a game expo where valve was attending gabe newell saw what the students made and hired them all on the spot most of the students joined the company and with some assistance from Valve themselves, they began working on a game with similar mechanics to Narbacular Drop. Keep in mind though, only 10 people worked on the first portal, compared to its sequel where it had a team of 40. Even with this small of a team though, they made two of the best games ever. How did their end product turn out? Well, I guess we gotta play it. When you start Portal 1, you're greeted to a very simple main menu with what looks like to be a cryogenic room. What I like about Valve games in general, especially the old ones, is that the main menu always shows an area in the game, making you already somewhat familiar with the setting without even having to play the game. The main menu is also accompanied by a very echoey and dark ambient sounding song if you could call it that. Oh, and this reminds me, before we get into the story of Portal 1 and 2, there's one very important thing about these games that I want to touch on which is the soundtrack. Just like the games, Portal's soundtrack is split into two distinctive sounds. Portal 1 being a very lonely and futuristic sound, with Portal 2 being very industrial sounding. Let's start off with Portal 1 for now. Simply, just listen to the main menu song. It's not really a song, it's more like sounds. Sounds of some type of machines humming in the background making it echo throughout the entire area. It's not welcoming, it's not a beat, but it familiarizes you instantly with what the game's tone is. Imagine some silly shit played instead of the main menu. That just wouldn't work with Portal 1's lonely atmosphere. There is only one happy song, if you could call it that, in Portal 1 besides the credits music, and it's called Subject Name Here. What a terrible name, wow. It's also rarely a song as well, mostly sounding like a boot up sound for an old 90s operating system.
The only thing saving this track from being in the rest of the lonely and depressing music bin is the fact that the chords of the song are ascending, giving it a more hopeful vibe compared to the rest of the soundtrack which is all unfamiliar and dark sounding, like the song Taste of Blood. The reason I'm telling you guys about this is because I want people to understand how great a soundtrack can paint a setting for a game, and no other game does it better than Portal 1 than Portal 2. Portal 2 rarely has any traditional instruments. The game setting really fuels the soundtrack. Since the game takes place in a facility, the soundtrack samples sounds of alarms, electronic grinding sounds, and synths. Now, if that sounds like a clusterfuck of sounds coming together, hear me out. It works amazingly. My favorite example is from the song called The Part Where He Kills You. Just for some context, by the way, the song plays in a part where somebody tries to kill you and you have to run. The song starts off surprisingly chill with distorted computery synth sounds. You know, like your average day at work. But it gets interrupted by an ear screeching synth sound and then the beat of an alarm kicks in. Signaling you something isn't right. As the situation worsens, the beat of the alarm keeps going until synth drum kicks in and the alarm speed up, signaling to, you know. All of these sounds work perfectly within the factory slash research facility setting of Portal because these are sounds that you would associate with that environment. If it was like any other soundtrack like guitars, it just wouldn't fit the theme of the game. Basically all the songs in Portal 2 sample the game's environment. Another good example is a robot ghost story. This song plays in a chapter of the game where you're exploring an area with dead robots. Since at this point in the game's story, you're extremely familiar with the whole being the only human in the whole facility. Facility. We'll get to that later, by the way. You've probably grown to humanize the only other things that seem alive, which are these turrets. As you're exploring the dark corridors of Avatar Science, you hear this extremely eerie dystopian pulsing bass sound. As you get closer to the door, high-pitched screaming sounds start to play until you open the door and see disassembled turrets and destroyed turrets on a conveyor belt, and you hear their distorted moans and cry for help. But this is an in-game audio. This is the song itself playing these sounds, perfectly sampled what you would hear in that environment. Literally every single song in the Portal 2 soundtrack has something unique about it that worked to enhance the setting and atmosphere of the game to an extent no other game has ever done it. Name another game that can make absolute bangers out of fucking industrial sounds. I could make a whole video longer than this one you're watching right here on the soundtrack of Portal, but weren't we talking about something? Oh yeah, back to Portal 1. When you first start the game, you wake up in a glass container, the exact same one from the main menu with a bed and just basic home accommodations. After a few seconds from looking around, a robotic lady voice starts talking and welcomes you to the Aperture Science Computer Aided Enrichment Center. For runtime sakes of this video, we're gonna call her by her actual name, which is GLaDOS. Even though you're not supposed to know her name this early on in the game, I just don't feel like calling her robotic lady voice for the rest of the video. She welcomes us to the facility and starts telling us about the safety instructions. The first sign that something is off happens when she's telling us the safety rules of the facility and it just glitches the hell out. For your own safety and the safety of others, please refrain from for such a clean, modern, and sterile looking facility, it's weird that GLaDOS is having a malfunction. We're not even out of the spawn room, and the game is already dropping hints that something is sus. Most first time players won't even pick up on it, but it's just one clue leading to a series of a million other clues that something is not right. She then tells us that the test is about to begin and opens us a portal to get out of here. The first thing you see out the portal is a girl in an orange jumpsuit, which is who we are playing as. This is the game's way of introducing us to characters to replay as. Since like most Valve games, the main character is mute, so yeah, we won't be hearing much out of her. Anyways, from here you do a reverse speed b-hop, use a clipboard as a speed boost and grab the radio and throw it towards the door as you stand on the button to open and have it jam the door, then reverse b-hop towards the exit while using the radio as a b-hop boost. 
Oh wait, wrong video. When you enter the first chamber, you're introduced to the first puzzle which consists of putting a box on a button to open a door. Sounds familiar? Yeah, that's some narbacular drop DNA right there. Where the door leads to is an elevator, and the elevator is what's going to take you to most of the test chambers throughout the game, making it a very thought out loading screen. Test chamber 2 is the exact same puzzle, but this time you need to go through pre-placed portals to get to the cube and wait for the portals to switch over to the room where the button is and place it on there. This early on in the game, you may also start to notice these glass observation rooms. It's pretty damn obvious we're in a testing environment, and this room gives us the vibe that we're being monitored, but there's nobody monitoring us. That could be nothing really that suspicious, because from what we saw, there is 19 other chambers where we may see a person, but in every single chamber in this game, there's a surveillance room, but nobody is ever in them. In fact, nowhere in the game we ever see or hear a person. It's like we're the only person alive in the game. Foreshadowing aside, we finally get the first iteration of the portal gun in Chamber 3, but this version of the gun only can shoot one portal. GLaDOS then starts telling us safety instructions of the portal device, and we get another sign that something isn't right because she glitches out again. Do not submerge the device in liquid, even partially. Most importantly, under no circumstances should you... Note that all of these glitches happened when she's been telling us something important so far. The first one happened when she was about to tell us some very important safety instructions for the facility, and on this one she was going to tell us something important about the device itself. It's like somebody or something doesn't want us to know what's important to our safety and is trying to erase it. We also see that this chamber's observation room is empty as well. The next few chambers are only meant to get the user familiarized with the portal gun's operation with not much things of concern, but it's only on Chamber 8 where we learn that our character might truly be in danger. GLaDOS tells us that the consequences of falling into the water will be death, but then rebukes that statement once we finish the test. Please note that we have added a consequence for failure. Any contact with the chamber floor will result in an unsatisfactory mark on your official testing record followed by death. Please note that any appearance of danger is merely a device to enhance your testing experience. Honestly, I feel like the water isn't supposed to be there. This facility is supposed to be a clean and safe area for us to test, but this water is neither clean nor safe, further playing into the theory that this facility's location is in Flint, Michigan. My theory is that this is GLaDOS' first attempt of killing us, hoping that we'd be too scared to finish the test and making us mess up and die, but then tries to restore her trust by telling us that we're not really in harm's way. On Chamber 10, we get another GLaDOS glitch, but this time she's not able to tell us anything about how to complete the test, just leaving it up to our own interpretation. Hello again. To reiterate, previous morning, <laughs> momentum. Honestly, I'm gonna stop pointing at the GLaDOS voice glitches from now on because I think y'all get the point now. She's kind of fucked up. The point of this chamber though is to teach us about momentum and how to use it in the game to complete puzzle and honestly, GLaDOS puts it in the perfect way. In layman's terms, speedy thing goes in, speedy thing comes out. The chamber afterwards is where we can finally see the improved portal gun, and we're told by GLaDOS that the Enrichment Center promises to To always provide a safe testing environment. In dangerous testing environments, the Enrichment Center promises to always provide useful advice. But the only advice GLaDOS gives us is that The floor here will kill you. Try to avoid it. It's kind of like she doesn't care about her safety and is going against her programming, like there's nobody there to control her. When we complete the puzzle, we finally get the second portal gun, and with this one, we're finally able to shoot two portals from the device, allowing us to do stupid shit like this. On Chamber 13, GLaDOS tells us that the tests are about to get harder since we have both portals readily accessible, and we get another hint that our safety is not her priority. If you become lightheaded from thirst, feel free to pass out. For some reason, I feel like she is getting more and more aggressive with us. What's proved my point is that at the end of the test, she says, When the testing is over, you will be missed. Missed. Something tells me that at the end of testing, we just won't leave the facility, but she's insisting of a different type of being missed. In one of the chambers ahead of that one, GLaDOS tells us that at the end of the testing, we're going to be given a cake. Now, keep this in mind. Not because of the stupid memes, please. 
but because of something else. And a few chambers afterwards, GLaDOS tells us that now we're testing with actual lethal military androids. She doesn't even tell us a hint on how to solve it, like stated in case of any danger, but instead just tells us, The Enrichment Center apologizes for the inconvenience and wishes you the best of luck. This chamber is really important, not because it shows that she wants us dead, but because in a tucked away secret corner, we can enter a room that looks separate from the rest of the facility. Everything in here is more industrial looking, like we're in the real part of the facility and not the facade that the fake sterile testing rooms were. The most disturbing part about this area is that on the wall we see scribbles of disturbing text and imagery. The cake is a lie, there's handprints everywhere, and also it seems like they were counting down days as well. We also see the word help drawn out on the floor. In the back we also find cans of food and water drugs, like whoever was here was camping out for days, shown by the markings on the wall. This part is like the ugly truth behind what Aperture truly is. We also see that the person marked the ceilings on where to place the portal to take out the turret, showing that whoever is doing this is familiar with the facility and is trying to help us get out of here, and is trying to warn us as well. On the next chamber, we're introduced to the companion cube, which is literally a cube with a heart. Now, if you're game theory, apparently the cube is alive. This cube quite literally is our companion though, because we need to carry it with us to complete the chamber. GLaDOS also tells us the symptoms of testing in this environment, which consists of our superstition, perceiving inanimate objects as alive, and hallucinations. This is important because in the same chamber we'll find another hideout and inside we see photos of the companion cube plastered all over photos of people and just non-comprehensive scribbling on the wall. Superstition and perceiving objects as alive and hallucination. I'm not hallucinating. You are. Companion cube we talk never desert. And just a ton of other random BS I honestly can't make out. GLaDOS told us those symptoms earlier because of whoever was in these rooms. It's obvious he's showing symptoms of perceiving inanimate objects as a lie, and superstitions and obviously hallucinations, because this writing on the wall looks like it was just wrote by a terrible schizophrenic. We also see more photos of the cube with hearts everywhere and poems even written. Not in cruelty, not in wrath, the reaper came today, an angel visited this gray path and took the cube away. This is an altered version of an actual poem called The Reaper and the Flower. What the poem is mostly interpreted by most people is that death is not as cruel as it's believed to be, because it's a thing that takes loved ones to a new world and should not be feared. Whoever was here really loved their companion cube to the point they were even hallucinating, but now the cube is gone and the person is going crazy. The writing on the last wall on the last chamber was very comprehensive. If anything, it was very informative, but this one, it's just ramblings of a schizophrenic. It's like he was alone for days and made friends with the cube, but the cube died on him, making him go insane. How did the cube die, would you say? At the end of the puzzle, GLaDOS literally forces you to incinerate the cube and this is how he probably lost his. I know to the player the cube is literally nothing, but for this character it meant a lot. It was their only company. Pretty soon we get to the last and final chamber of the test, chamber 19. GLaDOS tells us the instructions for once we finish the test. When you are done, you will drop the device in the equipment recovery annex. Enrichment center regulations require both hands to be empty before any cake. <laughs> As we know, the cake isn't real. Who knows what she has in store for us at the end. At the end of the test, as we're riding a lift, we see a sign for cake, but suddenly right next to it is a big fire pit. Laudos tells us thank you for participating in the testing and says her goodbye, but with quick thinking, you can portal over to a platform and this shocks Glados because she doesn't expect you to do that. She then lies and tells you that pretending to murder you was the final test, and honestly, you have to be an idiot to believe her on that. <laughs> The final half of the game takes you through the back rooms of Aperture Science, but this time, it just isn't the secret rooms that you've been seeing in those little hideouts. But now you're seeing how the turrets are built, the massive generators, and what powers this facility. This is just a big behind the scenes of what you were never supposed to see as a test subject. Louder tries talking to you and attempts to convince you to come back, but by then, you're already too deep in the back rooms. <laughs> Thank you.
In the back rooms, you can find empty meeting rooms, empty desks, and even go into one of the observation rooms that were empty throughout the game. Nobody was visible in the testing environments, and nobody's visible in the back rooms, showing that everyone has more than likely just disappeared or, as we all know it, probably died. I love this part of the game because it shows you what you're not supposed to see. The game at first makes you think you're just in a linear test chamber portal game, but this part of the game is not linear. You have to find out where to go and how to get there with no hints because this isn't supposed to be a testing environment. This is the real facility. Eventually, after surviving her last attempts to ambush you, you make it over to her chamber. With no signs of human life anywhere, it is only up to you to disable her. As GLaDOS is counting down to deliver her surprise, a piece of her falls off. She tells us not to touch it, but I proceed to grab it and throw it into the incinerator conveniently located right behind her. What this might have done though is probably make her even more evil. Just put it in the corner. Good news. I figured out what that thing you just incinerated did. It was a morality core they installed after I flooded the enrichment center with a deadly neurotoxin to make me stop flooding the enrichment center with a deadly neurotoxin. So get comfortable while I warm up the neurotoxin emitters. With no morality core on her and knowledge that everyone in the facility died because of her, with the addition of a neurotoxin that will kill us within 5 minutes, we're the only thing that can stop her. How we defeat her is by manipulating the path of the rocket she's shooting at us so they go through a portal and right back at her so it breaks one of the cores off of her and then we incinerate it. At the end we destroy the final core and everything just goes a shit and she starts breaking apart and everything starts floating up and then we just wake up in the parking lot of Aperture Science with all the debris falling down. Despite this full-on AAA game being so short that I was able to describe to you the entire story in what, like 14 minutes, it still won awards like Game of the Year. And plenty more. Because of this, like any other competent publisher, it would be the world's dumbest idea to not make a sequel to the game, but some mystery still lingered on from the first game. Who wrote these creepy messages? What was GLaDOS's motive? Well, all of those questions were eventually answered. Not in a sequel though, but in a comic book anybody barely even read. In the buildup of the making of Portal 2, Valve released a comic called Lab Rat, which talked about what's going on behind the scenes at Aperture while we were playing in the game's main story. The comic follows the story of a schizophrenic Aperture science employee named Doug Ratman. Yes, I know, terrible fucking name, but he was the sole survivor of GLaDOS killing everybody in the facility. Ratman is also a massive schizophrenic and befriends a companion cube and sets up all these little areas to help inform Sean and how escape. These areas are the little hideouts we've been seeing throughout the whole game in case you don't get it. But after losing his medicine, he starts to become even more insane and falls in love with his companion cube. But before he falls into total insanity, he saves Shell right after she defeats GLaDOS at the end of Portal 1 and puts her into stasis for millions of thousands of years. And this is what leads to the setup of Portal 2. But in order for this comic to actually make sense, they changed the original ending of Portal 1 to Shell being dragged back into the facility. So it makes sense. You know, Valve really has a thing for changing their game's endings. Portal 2 came out on April 18th, 2011 to astronomical reviews. But how did they improve upon the last game since, I mean, just like, look at it. It's very simple. Well, there's a few things they did. First up, they created a well-established story, improved upon the environments, added some of gaming's greatest characters, added humor, better graphics, better environments, added amazing set pieces, added sky bridges, orange gel, blue gel, white gel, lasers, cube that reflect lasers, punch pads, water, and many other things I can't name, but yes, they grabbed an already existing simple idea that was great enough and made it even more amazing. But enough talk, let's see what Portal 2 is actually all about. The game starts off with us waking up in a bed with an announcer telling us how long we've been in suspension for. Good morning! You have been in suspension for 50 days. We're then informed that we need to do some exercises regularly, and this leads to one of the best tutorials in any video games, because you literally learn basic shit such as, like, looking up. Good. This completes the gymnastic portion of your mandatory physical and mental wellness exercise. Once the game feels like you learned the basic controls of staring at fucking art, you are sent back to bed. You then wake up in the same room again, but now it's way more dilapidated and the announcer's glitching. That or he's telling us how long we've been in stasis for. Good morning. You have been in suspension for... Nine, 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 nine. 
There's also a knocking at the door and when we open it up we are introduced to popular Hollywood TV actor Stephen Merchant or in this game his name is Wheatley. Please prepare for emergency evacuation. Stay calm, stay, stay calm, prepare, it's all the same, prepare. After learning that the facility is in a meltdown, Wheatley takes control of our room and takes it to a different sector. As he's doing this, he's crashing our chamber into a lot of other chambers carelessly and let's just hope that uh, that this isn't foreshadowing anything. It also tells us that all the test subjects in the cryo room are dead and that it's his responsibility for it. The reserve power ran out, so of course the whole relaxation center stops waking up the bloody test subject. And of course, nobody tells me anything. No, why should you tell me anything? Why should I be kept informed? You know, about the life functions of the 10,000 bloody test subjects I'm supposed to be in charge of. And whose fault do you think it's gonna be when the management comes down here and finds 10,000 flipping vegetables? This actually was tackled in the Radman comics because before he either died or disappeared, he put Shell into stasis forever and rerouted power to only go to her room. After delivering our sleepy chamber to the end, Wheatley sends us out on our own and we find ourselves back in chamber zero, exactly where we first started off in portal one. The first two chambers we go through are the exact same chambers we went through in portal one but now i mean look they're way more run down and abandoned by a long shot i love the fact that you have to go through these chambers again because it's great nostalgia for portal one veterans and it's still a great way to introduce new people to the series on how the game works after chamber two we meet weedley again and he informs us that the portal gun is somewhere in this room but when we go over to it we fall into a massive tunnel luckily at the end of the tunnel we find the portal gun but many other images too one image of the scientists surrounding in GLaDOS, presumably the first time they power her on. But then the next image shows all the scientists panicking and running around and we see a stick figure right next to the companion cube. The image after that one shows Shell confronting GLaDOS and we see the stick figure with the companion cube again, who at this point we already know is Radman. The drawing after that one is the end of Portal 1, after Shell defeats GLaDOS and floats out of the facility and we see that Radman saves the portal gun and the final image shows us, Shell, and Stasis. This is honestly one of the greatest forms of environmental storytelling I've seen in a video game. Yes, Portal 1 did it amazingly as well, but here we see what happens after the events of Portal 1 without any stupid flashback scene and we learn so much from it. It doesn't leave any plot holes from the first game. With the Portal Gun, we can finally go back to the chambers and continue on finding our way out of here. As expected, we go through the same exact tests that we did in Portal 1, but without GLaDOS since, you know, she's dead. She's replaced by some backup AI though, who in my opinion is just the funniest guy ever. This the next test is very dangerous. To help you remain tranquil in the face of almost certain death, smooth jazz will be deployed in 3, 2, 1. After a couple chambers, we run back into Weedley again, who presumed we were dead after we fell into that pit. Oi, oi! I'm up here! Oh, brilliant! You did find a portal gun! Wheatley disengages himself from the management rail and wants us to plug him into a stick on the wall that opens up a secret panel so we can get out of there. The problem is though, in order to escape, we're going to need to go through Gladys's chamber, which we do as expected and, well, she's dead. He also tells us the fairy tale of the person who ended up defeating her, and it's funny because little does he know, it's actually us that did it. Do you know who ended up, uh, do you know who ended up taking her down in the end? You're not gonna believe this. A human. I know. I know, I wouldn't have believed either. Apparently this human escaped and uh, nobody's seen him since. Wheatley leads us into the main breaker room with all the power switches and wants us to find the escape pod switch so we can get out of here. Look for a switch that says escape pod. HOW?! After giving up, Wheatley wants us to plug him in so we can turn on the lights, but in return, he accidentally starts the platform and has it move up. Turning on all of the switches and this leads to possibly one of the most scariest and most anxiety inducing moments in any video game. Power up initiated. Okay, don't panic. All right, stop panicking. Uh, I can, I can still stop this. Um, uh, oh, there's a, there's a password. Okay, it's fine. I'll just, I'll just hack it. Not a problem. A A A A A um S. A A A A A C. Wait, did I do beat the jar of pen? Start writing these down. Power up, complete. I don't. Okay, okay, okay. Listen. All right, new plan. Act natural. Act natural. It's you. You know her? It's been a long time. After his <laughs> dumbass wakes up GLaDOS, she immediately throws us into the conveniently placed incinerator pit right behind her. After falling for quite a bit, we fall into the incinerator room and GLaDOS goes straight into guilt tripping us. Be careful not to trip over any parts of me that didn't get completely burned when you threw them down here. 
At the end of the room, we find the dual portal device, and GLaDOS has us go straight back into testing. As we're moving our way back into the testing room, GLaDOS tries to play the victim and makes us feel guilty by killing her by explaining what her black box does. I discovered I have a sort of black box quick save feature. In the event of a catastrophic failure, the last two minutes of my life are preserved for analysis. I was able, well, forced really, to relive you killing me again and again. Forever. It's easy to tell she's a totally different person than from what she was in Portal 1. Now instead of being passive aggressive with Shell, she is very straightforward to her and doesn't give a fuck about what she says now. Once we get out of the incinerator room, we find ourselves in the last chamber of Portal 1. You know, the one that had that platform that led to the fire pit. We then go back onto the elevator and GLaDOS takes us straight back into testing. Despite this facility being such a mess though. Luckily for game design sakes, these new chambers aren't rehashed from the first game, but they introduce us to new mechanics of Portal 2. like lasers and laser reflector cubes, launch pads, and sky bridges to add more stuff to the game so we're not just replaying the first game again. And unlike the first game, she's now just a total dick to us. Well done. Here come the test results. You are a horrible person. We see this throughout this section of the game with her constantly reminding Shell that she is adopted. Science has now validated your birth mother's decision to abandon you on a doorstep. Fat jokes. Most people emerge from suspension terribly undernourished. I want to congratulate you on beating the odds and somehow managing to pack on a few pounds. Calling us human garbage. I'm still cleaning out the test chambers, so sometimes there's still trash in them. Standing around. Smelling and being useless. Remember before when I was talking about smelly garbage standing around being useless? That was a metaphor. I was actually talking about you. Just get used to this. We're gonna see these childish insults throughout the entire game, so I hope you get used to being put down. After a few more chambers, we run into Wheatley again, showing that he survived being tossed away by GLaDOS earlier, and literally tries to basically explain to us his entire life story. The aerial faith plate in here is sending a distress signal. You broke it, didn't you? There. Try it now. What happened, right? I was just lying there. You thought I was done. Mm, this plate must not be calibrated to someone of your generousness. I'll add a few zeros to the maximum weight. You look great, by the way. Very healthy. Try it now. Hey bird, right? Couldn't believe it either. You seem to have defeated its load-bearing capacity. After a couple more chambers, we see him again, and now he's trying to disrupt GLaDOS, and he tells us to keep testing because he's gonna try to get us out of here. Okay, look, the point is, we're gonna break out of here, alright? Very soon, I promise, I promise. I just have to figure out how! The next six or something chambers have nothing really to be a note, but in one of them, we run into an other Ratman hideout with more graffiti showing shell and poems again. The bell invites, hear the turret for its knell, that summons to heaven or to hell. Take that as you want. In a couple chambers after, while we're riding an elevator down, we meet Wheatley again, who tells us to hang on for just a little bit more. Hey, how's it going? I talked my way onto the old nanobot work crew, rebuilding this shaft. They are really small. So, oh. I know, Jerry. No, I'm on a break, mate. I'm on a break. Ah! Just hang in there for five more... What? Jerry, you can't fire me for that. And by five chambers, he actually means two more chambers. During a fairly easy chamber, the lights to the facility go out and you find out that it's actually Wheatley who did it and he tries to help you escape. What's going on? Who turned off the lights? Hey, buddy, I'm speaking in an accent that is beyond her range of hearing. I know I'm early, but we have to go right now. Walk casually toward my position and we'll go shut her down. Look, metal ball, I can hear you. Run, I don't need to do the voice, run! During this escape, GLaDOS tries to trick you multiple times by opening fake chambers and telling you it's the last test, trapping you in a room with turrets, and even attempting to crush you with an entire testing chamber. Luckily, at the end, there's an elevator that takes you away from the parts of the facility that's in her controls, but in return, she purges the facility's lights. Despite this chunk of the game not being in the actual testing environment, but instead being in the actual facility itself, it still manages to be a portal game, because now you're portaling to other sides of the this massive facility. A little bit further ahead, you will find out where all the turrets are test fired before they go into production, and you also see that not all turrets come out equal. Target acquired. Uh, no 
robots. Yes, this game has robots with mental disabilities. Further ahead, you'll see that the good turrets are sent into use while the dumb ones are disposed of, and how the computer knows which ones to keep or not is by a template of a clean turret being the dictator on what to keep and what not to keep. Since you know, fuck Lados, he can rip out the template turret, but unfortunately, the computer has a memory, it can still continue with the empty template. Template missing. Continuing from memory. Oh, that's a right. But you can counteract this by grabbing one of the retarded turrets before they're incinerated and put it where the template was and that will throw away the good ones and keep the bad ones. With the facility's turret production sabotage, the next thing you need to go after is the neurotoxin generator. As you can see, the neurotoxin generator is pretty fucking big. But with these conveniently moving platforms running parallel with the tubes and a deadly laser, you can destroy the neurotoxin emitters and this will cause it to implode. Warning. Neurotoxin pressure has reached dangerously unlethal levels. <laughs> Dangerously unlethal levels, sounds funny. But the whole thing destroyed, you can then ride one of the tubes over to Glados' chamber, but unfortunately during this fun water park ride, you and Wheatley get separated. Luckily though, at the end, you're right next to Glados' chamber and you can portal to a room right next to it, with a door leading to Glados' emergency shutdown and cake dispensary. Keep unlocked. And when you try to open the door, it falls down because it obviously was a fake. But this leads to one of the most badass boss entrances in any video game ever. I honestly, truly didn't think you'd fall for that. In fact, I devised a much more elaborate trap further ahead for when you got through this easy one. If I'd known you let yourself get captured this easily, I would have just dangled a turkey leg on a rope from the ceiling. Well, it was nice catching up. Let's get to business. I hope you brought something stronger than a portal gun this time. Otherwise, I'm afraid you're about to become the immediate past president of the Being Alive Club. Uh -huh. After she tries to unsuccessfully ambush you with turrets you fucked up earlier, she tries to murder you with the neurotoxin, but that just brings Wheatley back here and the glass smashes as well. Hello! I hate you so much. Now that you're free, you can freely move around and plug in Wheatley into the core transfer bay. But you still need to override Gladys' command by pressing a button at the end of the room, but she blocks your way to the button. With some well-placed portals, you can get to the button and press it, which will start transferring Wheatley over onto Gladys' body. I want to be honest here, despite Gladys being a massive dick to us in the first game in this game, the scene of her getting ripped out of her body kind of makes me feel bad for her still. No! Now with Wheatley in control of the whole facility, he calls us the escape lift to get us out of here. Signs of a power trip become pretty damn obvious though, with him first telling us how small we look. Look how small you are down there! I can barely see you! Very tiny and insignificant! And him just fooling around. Wow, this is cool! And check this out! I'm a bloody genius now! Estás usando este software de traducción de forma incorrecta. Por favor, consulte el manual. I don't even know what I just said. After all this, Wheatley finally sends the lift back up, but this is where one of the worst anime betrayals to ever happen. Oh, sorry, no, the lift. Yes, sorry, keep forgetting. This body's amazing, seriously. I can't get over how small you are, but I'm huge. <laughs> One thing of note here, notice how this is the first time ever we've heard GLaDOS be on our side or acknowledge an accomplishment of ours. I understand she's out of her body and is powerless in this situation against us or Wheatley, so some may think she's looking for sympathy from Shell, but never has GLaDOS gave us any kind of accomplishment for Shell's achievements. Little Buckwheat then turns GLaDOS into a working potato batter, and here's where GLaDOS spills so much about who and what Wheatley truly is. <laughs> Sorry, what, uh, huh. what? The engineers tried everything to make me behave. To slow me down. Once, they even attached an intelligence dampening sphere on me. It clung to my brain like a tumor, generating an endless stream of terrible ideas. No, not this 
listening, not listening. It was your voice. No, you, no, you're lying, yes. you're lying. You're the tour. You're not just a regular moron. You were designed to be a moron. I am not a moron! Yes, you are. You're a moron they built to make me an idiot. Well, how about now? Now who's a moron? Could a moron hunt you into this? Because of Wheatley's dumb action right there, Shell and GLaDOS find themselves falling into this massive pit, and despite the good character we saw from GLaDOS, she still manages to be a jackass. So, how are you holding up? Because I'm a potato. Oh good, my slow clap processor made it into this thing. During this fall, GLaDOS elaborates more on what Wheatley's true purpose actually was, and why he was built. Here's a couple of facts. Just a regular moron. He's the product of the greatest minds of a generation, working together with the express purpose of building the dumbest moron who ever lived. And you just put him in charge of the entire facility. Good, that's still working. Finally, after what felt like years of falling, we find ourselves at the bottom of the pit with GLaDOS being pecked by a bird and then just kidnapped by it. Shell is now all alone in the deep parts of Aperture Science. This part of the game really shows you how stellar Portal's environments really are. You know you're deep underground, deeper than where you were once before. And still down here you see infrastructure, cranes in the distance, massive vertical scale of the pillars, the fog because of how big the area is. It's possibly one of the best environments in any entertainment product I've ever seen because to this day it's jaw dropping and it always will be. There's also a massive vault door that you need to get past by timing pressing two buttons simultaneously before the timer runs out and this leads to one of the most funniest video game moments ever. Get it? All that just for a tiny door! A little bit past the door, you'll find yourself to the entrance of the old Aperture Science facility, and you'll be introduced to a totally brand new character, JK fucking Simmons. Or in this game, his name is Cave Johnson, and he's the old CEO of the company. Welcome, gentlemen, to Aperture Science. Astronauts, war heroes, Olympians, you're here because we want the best, and you are it. So, who is ready to make some science? I am. <laughs> Now, you already met one another on the limo ride over, so let me introduce myself. I'm Cave Johnson. I own the place. That eager voice you heard is the lovely Carolyn, my assistant. Rest assured, she has transferred your honorarium to the charitable organization of your choice. Isn't that right, Carolyn? Yes, sir, Mr. Johnson. She's the backbone of this facility. Pretty as a postcard, too. Sorry, fellas. She's married. To science. Don't forget his mentioning of war heroes, astronauts, and Olympians as the people is greeting at first. This will be important later on the more we learn about the history of the place and also his assistant Carolyn. She's going to be super important later on. You don't even need to know the personality of Kate Johnson for a solid minute to know that the way he ran stuff at Aperture Science was very unsafe and risky. Those of you who volunteered to be injected with praying mantis DNA, I've got some good news and some bad news. Bad news is, we're postponing those tests indefinitely. Good news is, we've got a much better test for you. Fighting an army of Mantis men. Pick up a rifle and follow the yellow line. In this room, you also find a very young photo of Cave Johnson in a wall of achievements. Judging by the date on the trophies, we can narrow down that this part of Aperture Science was built sometime in the mid-40s from a salt mine, and was extremely successful in its early days with all these achievements. After exploring for a bit, you find yourself onto an elevator that leads to the super old test chambers of Aperture Science. On the first chamber, the game introduces you to a new thing called Propulsion Gel, which is some blue substance that makes you bounce, and once again, the OSHA violation that was this old facility becomes very apparent. Last poor son of a gun got blue paint. <laughs> 
all joking aside, that did happen. Broke every bone in his legs. And also this one right here, which I think is absolutely hilarious. Oh, in case you got covered in that repulsion gel, here's some advice the lab boys gave me. Do not get covered in the repulsion gel. We haven't entirely nailed down what element it is yet, but I'll tell you this, it's a lively one, and it does not like the human skeleton. Oh, and this one too on the next chamber. All these science spheres are made of asbestos, by the way. Keeps out the rats. Let us know if you feel a shortness of breath, a persistent dry cough, or your heart stopping. Because that's not part of the test. That's asbestos. The next five chambers solely exist just to show you how the blue gel works. And just like that, testing is over, but not quite. After completing those tests and running around the back rooms of Aperture Science, you're now at a newer part of the old facility, and hear Cave Johnson's beautiful voice again. Greetings, friend. I'm Cave Johnson, CEO of Aperture Science. You might know us as a vital participant in the 1968 Senate hearings on missing astronauts. And you've most likely used one of the many products we invented, but that other people have somehow managed to steal from us. Black Mesa can eat my bankrupt- Sir, the testing? Right. Now you might be asking yourself, Cave, just how difficult are these tests? What was in that phone book of a contract I signed? Am I in danger? Let me answer those questions with a question. Who wants to make $60? Cash. You can also feel free to relax for up to 20 minutes in the waiting room, which is a damn sight more comfortable than the park benches most of you were sleeping on when we found you. Other interesting thing here, remember how at first in the older part of the facility he was welcoming high figures in society, but now he's welcoming homeless people by his mentioning of park benches and $60? This is one sign of Aperture Science's decline because of the missing astronauts Cave mentioned. This led to them not being able to test any high value people. There's also another photo of Cave Johnson, but now he's much older, showing that some time has passed within the construction of this part of the facility. Judging by the look of everything, this part of the facility was constructed at some point between the 70s and early 80s. We also run into GLaDOS again, who seems like she's not having a great time. Say, you're good at murder. Could you ow, murder this bird for me? Oh. Ow. Ow. No, wait. Just kill it and we'll call things even between us. No hard feelings. Oh, thanks. Once we get rid of the bird, GLaDOS instantly goes into negotiation mode with us. She wants us to put her back into her old body so she can save the facility. <laughs> With the hope that GLaDOS is not lying to us and the trust that she will let us go, Shell then takes GLaDOS with her and continues on with Cave Johnson's testing. I know it's weird now that you're teaming up with your enemy, but in this situation, both of you guys are hopeless and as she said, you really have nothing to lose here, so might as well. On the next chamber is GLaDOS's first time hearing Cave Johnson's voice, which she recognizes and even responds to. The testing area is just up ahead. The quicker you get through, the quicker you'll get your 60 bucks. Oh, God. Oh. Carolyn, are the compensation vouchers ready? Yes, yes sir, Mr. Johnson. Why did I just... Who is that? You're also introduced to a new gel, which is this orange speed gel you're going to need for the next few chambers to complete them. And also, at the end of one of the chambers, Cave Johnson expresses more of his hatred for homeless people. Hey, listen up down there. That thing's called an elevator, not a bathroom. I swear I know him. I don't know why I find these so funny. At the end of these two chambers, you finally complete this sector of the testing and are free to explore around the facility. Thank you. I can't believe I'm thanking these people. As you're roaming around, GLaDOS won't keep Carolyn off her mind and tries to remember who she is. Carolyn, 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 why do I know this woman? Did I kill her? Or... Oh my god. Look, you're doing a great job. Can you handle things for yourself for a while? I need to think. A little bit more ahead, you find yourself back in the enrichment center and hear Cave Johnson's voice again. But now it's super obvious that he's sick. Welcome to the enrichment center. <coughs> Since making test participation mandatory for all employees, the quality of our test subjects has risen dramatically. 
and employee retention, however, has not. <coughs> As a result, you may have heard we're going to phase out human testing. There's still a few things left to wrap up, though. And the bean counters told me we literally could not afford to buy seven dollars worth of moon rocks, much less seventy million. Bought them anyway. Ground them up, mixed them into a gel. And guess what? Ground up moon rocks are pure poison. I am deathly ill. There's even a newer portrait of Cave and it shows how old and sick he is, especially compared how he used to look in the younger portraits of himself. And so it's obvious again because of these newer looking posters that some time has passed from the old facility to this one. On these new testing tracks you're introduced to a new liquid which is a silver conductor gel which allows you to place portals on wherever it touches. Since you can't place portals on all surfaces, if you get this gel on the surface you can place a portal onto it. At the end of the test we hear Cave Johnson talk about something very important, which is GLaDOS. If we can store music on a compact disc, why can't we store a man's intelligence and personality on one? So I have the engineers figuring that out now. Brain mapping, artificial intelligence, we should have been working on it 30 years ago. I will say this, and I'm gonna say it on tape so everybody hears it a hundred times a day. If I die before you people can pour me into a computer, I want Carolyn to run this place. <coughs> now she'll argue. She'll say she can't. She's modest like that, but you make her. <coughs> Hell, put her in my computer. I don't care. All right, test's over. <coughs> Goodbye, sir. This confirms that Carolyn is GLaDOS. Cave Johnson died before they could put him onto a computer, so they put his assistant Carolyn on it instead to run the facility. The question is though, how did Carolyn's personality go from the sweetheart we were hearing on the testing tracks to this evil robotic AI that was holding us hostage? I know that question sounds super important, but we still need to focus on getting out of the old facility. During your escape out of here, you can find a poster detailing what to do in the event of a rogue AI, which is to know your paradoxes. Number one, stand still. Number two, remain calm. Number three, scream. The statement is false. New mission refuse this mission. Does a set of all sets contain itself? If you don't know what a paradox is for some reason, it's a statement that contradicts itself, meaning it cancels itself out. Think of zero times zero equals zero. Cloudo sees this and believes this is the way to stop Wheatley. Paradoxes. No AI can resist thinking about them. I know how we can beat once you get out of the old facility, you find yourself back in the new part of Aperture Science where Wheatley is in control of everything. Despite us not being there, he finds a way to make testing subjects out of cubes and turds so they do the tests instead of us. For God's sake, your boxes with legs. It's, it's literally your only purpose. Walking onto buttons. How can you not do the one thing you designed for? He really doesn't know what he's doing. When we go down onto the testing platform, GLaDOS tries to hit him with the paradox trick, but it just doesn't work. Hey, moron. Oh. Hello? Alright, paradox time. This sentence is false. Don't think about it. Um, true. In return, we have to continue on with his tests, and the next chamber we see that his tests are pretty damn easy. Literally, this one consists of pressing a button, and a box falls onto the button, opening the door. Wheatley likes the fact that we solved this test so much, he literally has an orgasm, and tells us to solve the test again. Oh, that felt really good. Oh, here's an idea. Since making tests is so difficult, why don't you just keep solving this test? So what? And I can just, like, watch you solve it. Yeah, that, that sounds much easier. Here we go! Now, do it again. But this time when we solve it, he doesn't get that weird orgasm again. And... Nothing. Alright, can't blame you for trying. On the chamber after, we're introduced to these gravity funnels which will move you in the direction the funnel is headed. All these new gimmicks, by the way, will be important later on. After a few of Wheatley's chambers, he starts to not get the euphoric response he was getting earlier when we completed his earlier tests, and believes that it's because we're not motivated enough. So he pulls a GLaDOS and starts to insult us, but even GLaDOS comes into our defense. Alright, so that last test was seriously disappointing. Apparently, being civil isn't motivating you, so let's want to Try her way, all right? Fatty, adopted fatty, 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 no parents. And what? What exactly is wrong with being adopted? What, what's wrong with being adopted? Uh, uh, well, also, but look at her, you moron. 
She's not fat. I am not a moron! I find that she's now on our side ironic because all the times she... They abandoned you at birth. When we solve the next test after, Wheatley starts to complain about he isn't feeling anything. And GLaDOS explains what it is and what truly is motivating him to test us. I, he's squatting in. My body has a built-in euphoric response to testing. Eventually, he'll build up a resistance to it. It can get a little unbearable unless you have the mental capacity to push past it. It didn't matter to me. I was in it for the science. If you don't understand what she's saying, what she means is that every time we complete a test, the AI that is in control literally has a sexual orgasm that it can build a tolerance to, making it construct harder puzzles for the test subject. This is what corrupted Carolyn and what corrupted Wheatley. Before all of this, as you could see, they were just normal, nice people. But the GLaDOS lifeform disc itself that they're in makes them only want to do one thing, which is test, like Wheatley told you earlier. But you have no idea what it's like in this body. I have to test all the time or I get this this itch you know it must be hardwired into the system or something the euphoric response is what the main driving force for GLaDOS and Wheatley is Wheatley doesn't know this and on the next chamber he moves it closer to him because he thinks it's a proximity thing don't mind me just moving the old test chamber a little bit closer to me um, out of thought maybe proximity to the test solving might give us stronger results what was that? Oh, sorry, I could have sworn he said something. He's taking us right to him. This is perfect. In a chamber or two, Wheatley informs us that he has a surprise, copying Lado's schmick. You two are gonna love this big surprise. In fact, you might say you're going to love it to death. Pretty obvious he's gonna try to kill us as well. On the next chamber, he activates the surprise, which flings us over to him and tries to kill us. Hence, this is the part where he kills you. Luckily, there's an escape way by using the portal conductor gel to portal over to a walkway and then make a run for it. As you're running, Wheatley tries to kill you by attempting to smash you with a spike wall, attempting to smash you with an entire test chamber, trying to murder you with turrets but they're all the retarded ones still, trying to kill you with a spinny blade wall, more spike planes, but none of this works at all. He was built to be an idiot, so his traps are very idiotic. GLaDOS is too pissed off about this and she tells us what her plans are once she's back in control of the facility. First, he'll spend a year in the incinerator. Year two, cryogenic refrigeration wing. Then, ten years in the chamber I built where all the robots scream at you. Then, I'll kill him. We're introduced to one more final thing in this game, which are explosives. These explosives can go through portals and blow up shit like pipes carrying the conductor gel. After this part though, you and GLaDOS are on the way to Wheatley's chamber to kill him. And GLaDOS pitches us her plea on why we should trust her this time. You know, She's claiming that now, since she's no longer in the GLaDOS body, that she's actually herself, and here's her own consciousness of Carolyn. Right before you enter Wheatley's chamber, there's a massive pit of corrupted cores, and GLaDOS has the idea in order to defeat him, we need to attach some of the cores onto his body so the system detects him as a corrupted core in order to start the process of a core transfer. You plug GLaDOS into the lift, and then she takes you up, and now you're face to face with Wheatley. Well, 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 welcome to my this boss battle brings together everything we learned from the game, using Wheatley's bombs to destroy the conductor gel pipes, portaling his bombs so they hit him, and then using the jump or speed gel to get over to GLaDOS to take the corrupted cores and then attach it onto him. This is why I was telling you about all those gels and all that earlier. It all worked as a tutorial up to this moment. The three corrupted cores we attached to Wheatley are hilarious as well. One just talks non-stop about space. <laughs> The other is some dumbass cowboy. I don't want to scare you. I'm an adventure sphere designed for danger. 
Why don't you go ahead and have yourself a little lady break? Just... And the other one just spits false information 24 7. Marine Curie invented the theory of radioactivity, the treatment of radioactivity, and dying of radioactivity. Once all the cores are attached to Wheatley, it's time to start the core transfer to put GLaDOS back in charge. Just like last time we did a core transfer, we need to go press the button and this is the only time Wheatley was ever smart. No! Do not press that button! Do not do Part 5! Booby trap the stalemate button! Luckily, Shell is still alive after the explosion, and looking up as the facility is imploding upon itself, you see the moon. Remember what Cave Johnson said earlier? More specifically about moon rock being a good portal conductor? Ground up moon rocks are pure poison. I am deathly ill. Still, it turns out they're a great portal conductor. There's no other option here, and when you shoot the portal up... It's one of the coolest scenes ever. While we're in space, Wheatley all of a sudden becomes his old self, now trying to help us and telling us that he can save us if we just hold on. Let go! We're in space! 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 Ah, let go! Let go! I'm still connected! I can pull myself in! I can still fix this! I already fixed it. And you are not coming back. Oh no! Change your plans! Hold on to me! Tighter! Ah! After GLaDOS knocks away Wheatley and pulls us back into the facility, we wake up one final time to these two robots and GLaDOS back in her body. But this isn't the GLaDOS we know anymore. This is Carolyn. She's happy that we're alive. Oh, thank God, you're all right. You know, being Carolyn taught me a valuable lesson. I thought you were my greatest enemy, but all along you were my best friend. The surge of emotion that shot through me when I saved your life taught me an even more valuable lesson. Where Carolyn lives in my brain. Carolyn, delete. Goodbye, Carolyn. All that progress just for GLaDOS to delete Carolyn from her memory forever. Luckily, she doesn't betray us here. Now that she's back to her true form, she talks her shit and then lets us go, telling us to never come back ever again. As we're going up on the elevator, it suddenly stops to two turrets, but they deactivate and start singing. <laughs> Now our elevator is going up and we find ourselves watching a turd opera with the fat one being the main voice and a massive tiger skin being the bass. As the lift is going up we still hear the music and the door opens and we find ourselves outside. Outside of the facility in the middle of a crop field and as a gift from GLaDOS she returns our companion cube. 10 years later, Portal 2 is still regarded as one of the best video games ever. The fact Valve managed to make a simple puzzle game have one of the best stories ever is just amazing. Despite the fact I spoiled the whole game to you, Portal 1 and 2 and all the secrets within it, please, if you can, play both games. There is so much I am leaving out, story and plot wise. If anything, I, I just did a quick rundown of what the story actually is. It's one of the best stories ever and I play a lot of video game stories and the entire Portal franchise is somewhere on my top three. It's one of the best games ever and it's literally 10 bucks and you're gonna love it. One thing is missing that I haven't talked about yet though, which is the co-op mode. During Portal 2's marketing, the co-op mode was the main selling feature of the game. Just look at it. No shell or Wheatley or even a story. Unfortunately, a lot of my friends suck and don't play games like Portal and I only have one friend who's played Portal 2 in their life, which is Kabuki on YouTube. You might know him. And I need someone to play co-op with so I can complete this full review on how great Portal is. Unfortunately, this is how it went when I try to ask him to play Portal 2 co-op. Yo, what's up? Yo! Alright, so I'm making a video on Portal right now, both games. I wanna make a video on co-op mode. You're like the only person I have on Steam added. Do you wanna like hop on Portal 2 for a little bit, play it, and then I'll like make a review on it? You could be in the video. No, I don't wanna fucking play that shit ass fucking game. Okay? How? Well, how is it? The music fucking sucks. Everything fucking sucks. How? I don't wanna see that shit. You know, how? puzzles suck as well. No one likes puzzles. puzzles how? Are how is it a bad game? Puzzles. Puzzles suck. Okay, yeah, fuck it. Yeah, every video game sucks then. Yeah, fuck you. In conclusion, Portal sucks. Subscribe to me. Thank you for watching. Love you. Bye.